Okay. So um, it's very nice to sort of be here. I I'm actually, of course, in New York and it's um, much too early in the day here. But in any event, um, I it's nice to honor Gilles Pages on his 60th birthday. So, bon anniversaire. And what I'm gonna speak on today is joint work with my PhD student, Alejandra Quintos of uh, Mexico. So uh, the title is Optimal Group Size for Micro Lending. Oops. Okay, so first of all, I, I don't think I can assume that uh, everybody knows what micro lending is. So I'll, I'll explain it a little bit. It's basically associated with uh, Mohammed Yunus. He, he was born in uh, Batua, Chittagong in 1940, got his MA in economics in 1961. And he left East Pakistan and returned after he became independent and became Bangladesh in 1971. During, and then there was a big famine in 1974 and Eunice devoted his energies uh, to try to reduce poverty. So in 1976, he visited the village of Chobra near Chittagong, Chittagong, which in case you've never heard of it, has two and a half million people. So it's not a trivial city. And he discovered that very small loans could make an enormous difference in a poor person's life. In particular for women, he noticed that uh, the women made bamboo furniture. But to do that, they had to buy the bamboo, bamboo. And to buy the bamboo, they would take out loans. And the loans were at an extremely high rate of interest because the women had no credit history. Because in Bangladesh at the time, women were completely excluded from all aspects of the economy that used money that was reserved for their husbands. So they had absolutely no credit history. And that usually means they charge a lot of interest. So Eunice approached traditional banks to lend to the poor and he found that they weren't interested because the poor weren't credit worthy. So he did some experimenting around and then uh, he started a project which in 1983, he converted his project into a, into a bank, which he, be, which he started called the Grameen Bank, which translated means the village bank. And it specialized in giving small loans to, poor, to the poor. In particular, his idea was to give uh, small loans to groups of women, usually five women, he would charge minimal interest in fees. And he select the groups that he thought would repay the loans. And to a huge extent, like 97%, they did. Um, and so as by the time of May 2008, which is the last the date I have information for, Grameen Bank had 7.5 million borrowers, 97% of whom were women. It had lent over $7 billion to poor people since its inception, and the repayment rate had been very close to 100%. In 2006, Eunice received the Nobel Peace Prize. The Nobel Peace Prize is not really an academic prize, it being awarded by the Norwegian parliament, but it does show a certain amount of uh, recognition. And so uh, the idea is, and it's called micro lending, is to arrange a small loan. And when I say small, I, I definitely mean small, usually between $20 and $30 with a fixed repayment date. One lends to a small group and Eunice proposed the group be five women. Uh, and the reason he lent primarily to women was that uh, they were kept outside of the economy and had no credit history. Now there's a lot of academic literature on the subject, even though many of us may not be familiar with anything about it. And perhaps that's because most of the literature is due to economists and not mathematicians. 
So it revolves around four themes. The first is why is group micro lending successful in reducing defaults, which apparently it is. And so Stiglitz, who also won a Nobel Prize, and Varian, who's the editor of Annals of Finance, Conlon, Murdoch, Chaudhuri, and Tedeschi all have prominent papers on that subject. Another subject is charging penalties if the group does default. Typically, the penalty is an exclusion from getting a future loan, not a permanent exclusion, but just for a period of time. So uh, this has received some academic attention, including by Francine and Mark Diener and their collaborators. And, uh, and then there's an intuitive approach to explain uh, why the group size is, why what one group size should be better than another. And papers in that area are by Armand Dariz, Allen, and Allen. And then there's a game theoretic approach about group size, which is by Gine and the other names, which I won't try to pronounce. Okay. Now there are various issues such as the size of the loan, transaction costs, maximizing the profits of the lending institution. And this, these will not be addressed in this talk. What this talk is about is maximizing or minimizing actually the probability of default on a loan. So um, to create a model, we're going to assume that within each group of five borrowers or six borrowers or four borrowers or whatever, that the group is fairly homogeneous. Okay, and so to, mathematically, that means that if NI is the event of no default of member I in a group of size K, then script NK is the event that the group of size K does not default. And so phi of K is the function one minus PK of N1. Now, if we assume they're all IID, that's the same as PK of NI for any I, okay? But that depends on group K, their IID within a specific group. Not, not the whole, not all borrowers are IID, just, just those in a specific group. Okay, and if even one member of the group defaults, then the whole group defaults. Now it's easy to, it's easy to imagine why one member might default, they might just take all the money and leave the group and run away. They may have a health emergency in their family. They may have some other um, major household expense. And so they may just steal the money in the hopes that, you know, well, the group's important, but it's more important that, you know, my son or daughter doesn't die. So they take the money. And if that happens, then they default and the whole group defaults. So we make the following assumptions that for a fixed size K, the group members are independent and identically distributed. The probability of default of one person depends on the size of the group. And the way we do that is since they're IID, we can just look at the default of person one. And then we have a different measure, PK, depending on the size of the group. So a group of size K has the measure PK. And we assume, of course, that PK of N1 is positive because otherwise everything is trivial. Okay, so we want to find the optimal group size, which means we want to find the number of people K star that maximizes the probability of no default in the group. Okay, so under these assumptions, along with our definition of default of a group, this translates into maximizing the quantity in equation one at the bottom of the screen here, equation one, uh, where you just take the intersection and uh, you get one minus phi of k to the kth power, okay? And so this is our result this theorem, which says that 
it's easier to express if we if we write the reciprocal. So we let V of K be one over FK. So FK is the function one over VK. And let's assume that it's defined for all X and R plus. Of course, we're only interested in integers, but it's, it's convenient to consider all real numbers because then we can use calculus. So we assume uh, four basic assumptions, although the fourth assumption has parts. So the first assumption is that f of x is bigger than one, which means that phi of x is less than one, which of course it has to be. And that's for all x bigger than two, because the, gr the group size has to be at least two. <laughs> that f of x is two times continuously differentiable, and the derivative is positive for all x bigger than two. So it's increasing, which means phi of x is decreasing. And then the fourth assumption, which is the strangest one perhaps, is that if you take any two real numbers, a and b, with a less than b, bigger than two, such that we have either condition 4.1. Now these look a little bit strange, but, but if you just think of um, Taylor's theorem, expanding around a or expanding around b, it then becomes kind of intuitive. So, um, and uh, the second condition is that the second derivative is negative. So that means the first derivative is positive. So with the second derivative negative for all X in an interval a, b, that means it's increasing, but con concave in that interval. Or, we could take the assumptions 4.3 and 4.4, which are almost the same, except the role of one half here and one are interchanged. So we get that the A term is one and the B term is a half. And instead of being uh, concave, we make it convex. And then in this case, one minus phi of X raised to the X power has a unique maximizer x star in AB. And then if in addition, A and B are the unique uh, real numbers that have these properties, then x star is the unique maximizer. So that's our theorem. And, and, and then the rest of this talk is gonna be how to use this theorem to obtain results. Okay, so... Um, so first we'll interpret the theorem. So the probability of no default we already, we've already mentioned is just a one minus phi, k, phi of k to the kth power for a group size of k. And due to the independent and identical distribution assumptions, there are two interacting forces affecting the probability of phi of nk. On the one hand, this term decreases at, as k increases because phi of k is less than one. On the other hand, we set phi of k to decrease as k increases as an assumption with the hope to find a maximizer k star. Okay, because we have, we have on the one hand, the product is decreasing, but if the, if the uh, terms you're multiplying are increasing, then there might be some rate in which they balance out. All right. So um, the intuition of this is that a group is better than lending to an individual, but as the size of the group increases, the advantages diminish and tend to zero. There should therefore be some happy compromise of group size increasing, but not becoming too big. Okay, so there are two opposing forces. As the group size increases, and this is just intuition, the responsibility for performing one's tasks becomes dispersed, increasing the likelihood that one or more member of the group may default. Now, typically in a group, there will be a leader or a primary organizer, the alpha woman, who's the force behind the loan. And she needs to ride herd on the other members, keeping them in line, 
15 B, you know. Uh, when I was at Cornell, I had to lead group projects of, and, and uh, the group project size was six master students. And in those groups, there was always a leader and often there was a goof off, somebody who didn't get the work done. And so um, if the leader was a good leader and enforced discipline, the group did better. If the leader just took care of his end and didn't make sure that the rest of the people were doing their job, then the group uh, had problems. For example, there was always a person in the group who could program a computer there was also always a person in the group who was familiar with data and could work with statistics. There was always a person in the group who understood the mathematics and always a person who could speak English and write, write the text up in English. The groups had sponsors, so the presentation of the results was important and so on. So if one of these areas felt was not correct, then it created a problem for the entire group. However, if the group has a leader, the larger the group, the more taxing um, the efforts to keep everybody in line will be. You can imagine if the group were 20 people or 40 people or 100 people or 1,000 people, one leader can't really be effective. So this is captured by phi of k as different functions give different peer pressure levels or intensities and hence lead to different um, K star, which K star being the optimal group size. So, so that's the intuition we have. On the other hand, as the group size contracts, each person becomes more important. So if you have a, a bozo in the group, bozo is English slang for clown, somebody who doesn't do anything then it's harder to recover. So if you have a group size of two or three and one of the person is sabotaging the group by not doing his or her part, then it's harder to recover from that than if the group is bigger. And in the limit case of only one borrower, which actually there's lots of data on micro lending to groups of size one borrower, um, banks, the, the one country I know about is Ghana because I had to get, go to Ghana to give a mini course, and Monique Jean Blanc was there, for example. And um, I was talking to people there, and it turns out that micro lending is very popular in Ghana, but often the banks lend to groups of size one, <laughs> and uh, which of course defeats the whole idea of micro lending. And the consequences of lending to group size one is they have extremely bad results. And so protect themselves from extremely bad results. They charge gigantic interest, interest rates. To give you an example, one of the sponsors of one of my groups at Cornell was Grupo Uno. And you've probably never heard of Grupo Uno, but at the time, it might still be, it was the largest issuer of visa cards in Central America, Central America being countries that are south of Mexico and north of Colombia. So Panama, Honduras, Nicaragua, El Salvador, Guatemala, that's Central America. So they would lend, they would lend to these countries. And the problem with having a visa card issued to a, a borrower in one of these countries is they had no credit uh, rating agencies at all. Nobody, Nobody in any Central American country had a credit history. So how do you decide what interest to charge if there's no credit history? And uh, I discuss, and I asked them that. You know, that was their that was their project. How do you make this decision? And I said, well, how do you stay in business? You know, you don't have a solution yet. And they said, oh, because some of the countries had laws against usury, so the the credit interest rates they could charge were, were um, by law, not allowed to be too high. And when that happened, they would just um, charge what they could, and then they would charge fees. 
So the fee was, you know, you were charged a, a very large fee if you were late making your payment or if your check bounced when you made your payment or just if anything at all went wrong, you were charged a very large fee. And so that's how they got around the, uh, the fact that they couldn't charge high interest rates. And one country where, they, where there were no laws against usury, I think it was Honduras, they charged an interest rate of 60%, soixante. So, uh, I mean, that's even higher than Societe Generale in France. So 60% uh, is extremely high. And, uh, that's, and so I asked pe people in Ghana what interest rates they were charging and gave this history about 60%. They said, oh, they're charging more than 60% in Ghana because their experience is very bad. So it really is important to, uh, use, to not just take the idea of micro lending and abuse it with group sizes of one lender, but to take the entirety of the idea of Muhammad Yunus and uh, take it seriously, which most banks in the developing world do not do. I asked Alejandra what goes on in Mexico, and she said that it's they have lots of problems in Mexico as well. Okay, so um, now now going back to mathematics, as the group size increases, there are more independent chances of failure. It's riskier to have k plus one possible defaults than it is to have k. And so this causes P of script N K to decrease as K increases. And we have to offset this problem through the choice of phi of K. And so the issue is to find the right speed of decay of phi of K. And this is addressed by our one theorem, which I stated earlier. So it is important to note that our theorem is useful because not all phi of k can work. So the obvious choice of phi of k, in some sense, the mathematically intuitively natural choice is if phi of k equals one over k. And just to remind you, this is like f of x equals x. So it's the simplest choice you can make. This happens, f of x equals x happens to be my favorite function of all time. I even prefer it to constants. And, uh, but if you choose this as your phi of K, there is no finite group size that, uh, that minimizes the probability of default. You have to go up to infinity. Now at this point, I, I have to apologize uh, for the ambient noise, which could get obsessed, horrible, because um, I live in a building in New York where they're doing uh, repairs on the exterior walls and they're doing it on different parts of the building uh, at different periods of time. And it turns out that today they're doing it directly outside the window, my windows. So you may hear some hammering or drilling. And if you do, I apologize. And there doesn't seem to be any way to avoid this. So that's quite unfortunate, but the best way to avoid it is it's currently 25 minutes after 8 a.m. here. And the, uh, they're not allowed to work before 8.30 a.m. So you shouldn't hear bad noise until 8.30 a.m., <laughs> which is in five minutes, but still, okay. So we're going to try to explain this um, by, uh, giving, by studying a key example. And it's an example that gives us a maximizer close to five, which was the so group size that Unit, Mohammed Yunus uh, suggested in his book, Banker to the Poor, which was published in 1998. And it's the group size he used in Bangladesh. So for this, so for this purpose, let us choose a function f of x which has two components, x to the alpha plus natural log x to the beta power. And this example captures two different forces at play. The part of f of x given by x to the alpha represents the group leader's ability to influence the group's performance. 
So this kind of is a function that depends on, on the talents of the group leader to choose a group that's responsible, and has ethics, and also the ability of the group leader to handle the size of a size, a reasonable size of the group. The, uh, the other component, natural log x to the beta, could be thought of as representing the quality of the group at play. So if these are good people who have self-respect and want to honor their friends and neighbors, then that this function should be higher, larger. Okay, so we chose log x, which is, has a slower growth rate than x for the quality of the group, because intuitively we think this is less important than the ability of the leader. So to be more specific, let's consider the, the power alpha, remember it was x to the alpha, take that to be P as parameter. And then we will take beta, which is the power to which we raise natural log X to be the reciprocal one over P. It doesn't have to be, this is just for an example. And this is for P in the interval one half to one. Uh, okay, and this gives us countervailing forces. And um, so we're, we're attributing more, con more importance to um, the non-material resources we need than the material resources. Now we don't have to choose beta to be one over P. We do that for mathematical convenience. Other choices could be alpha equals P, but beta equals one over P squared, or beta equals one over P cubed, and so on. Now there are two cases in this interval, one half one, which not surprisingly are the endpoints which is P equals one half and P equals one. And if we use those two values for P, then we get the group size, the optimal group size X star is 5.13. Remember we're using real numbers, so it's a continuous variable. And, uh, and X star equals 4.62 respectively. And if you round those off to the nearest integer, you get five. And so you get the, uh, the group size of units that Eunice proposed. Um, and if you want to eliminate the natural log X, then um, you can take F of X equals XP, as long as you don't take the endpoints one half and one and use the, an open interval. However, for the function f of x equals x to the p, so this doesn't have the log x term. When p is close to one, for example, p equals 0 0.999, which is pretty close to one. Um, if you're a biologist, for example, then it's actually equal to one. Then the maximizer is x star is 503, which is kind of ridiculous. Okay, and when P is close to one half, for example, P equals 0 0.501, then X star, the maximizer is 1.956. So the, the group size is two, which is also not that great. So we think that using log X is better. And um, we have to show that our function satisfies the hypotheses of our theorem. And fortunately for us, it does. I'm not gonna bore you with that. Uh, because in the process of this verification, it, there are some complicated and kind of annoying and not very pleasant calculus calculations. Um, but we can show as a more abstract result, or more general result, that f of x equals x of p x to the p log x to the one over p, that the maximizer x star, whatever it is, has to be inside the interval three, seven, which means three, one of three, four, five, six, or seven for all p, for all p in the interval one half to one. So um, if we do more work, and this was completely due 
to Alejandro Quintos, all I said was, it would be nice if we could make that interval smaller. And she went away and did this. And, um, and so we can obtain a smaller interval. And so for the same function f of x, we get the interval x star is in 3.48 to 5.4 for all p simultaneously in one half to one. And we note, of course, that only the integers four and five are in this interval, which means that the optimal group size is either four or five. So, um, so that's nice. So this, this sort of is an after the fact, um, extremely arbitrary in, in, in a lot of ways, but at least it's coherent and mathematical and quantitative justification of, uh, Mohammed Yunus's choice of the group size five, which was not our goal. Our goal was just to find a way to obtain an optimal group size. Now, if you do some totally disgusting numerical calculations, and of course I use the word disgusting fairly easily. I'm sure there are people in the audience and I can even name some, I'm sure, who, who do not think these would be disgusting calculations. But they're sufficiently disgusting that we had to check them using Mathematica and MATLAB because, you know, when it comes to calculations, I make a lot of mistakes. So um, I'm not sure Alejandra does, but I do. So uh, when P is in 0.5 to 0.539, which is a small interval close to a half, or when it's in a small interval close to one, example we give is 0.993 to one, then X star is actually in the interval 4.5 to 5.5, giving us without question, a maximal groups, an optimal group size of five members. And this is the group size proposed by Mohammed Yunus, which just is a kind of a posteriori uh, justification of the intuition of a rather spectacular economist. So, um, and that's all I have to say. So thank you for your attention.